Let's take a look at the history of dolphin research. It's said that dolphin research started with the ancient Greeks. Aristotle identified the dolphin as an ocean-dwelling mammal. By the early 1700s, the English naturalist John Ray had dissected dolphins and found them to be intelligent creatures with brains about the size of man's. In 1938, the world's first aquarium opened in Florida, and with it, the start of captive breeding. From the 1950s, there has been research on dead and captive dolphins. There was a shift toward the study of wild dolphins, which broadened to include dolphin healing. Let's meet our researchers. Dr. Ken Norris the leading dolphin researcher. John C. Lilly, researching interspecies communications. Dr. Paul Spong, the orca expert. Dr. Betsy Smith, exploring the power of animal healing. Dr. Denise Hertzing, studying wild dolphins. Dr. Horace Dobbs talks about dolphins and us. Dr. Lyle Watson, the Distinguished Life Scientist. For more information, choose a researcher and press any button. Wow! Who are those dolphins? And we began to work with them uh, over the years, and the pages unfolded slowly, and um, we began to learn that we really were working with uh, one of the higher orders of mammals. Well, I wanted to study the brain and the mind, and this is the only way you could get the mind isolated. So the isolation flotation tank was invented in 1954. I was intrigued by the fact that this dolphin that had done this had a brain as big as mine, as complex as mine, and if current evolutionary theory is correct, they've had them for 20 million years longer than us. Now I thought you don't carry a big brain around in your head for 20 million years and not do anything with it. Other, if, you, if you weren't doing anything with it, it would have atrophied. So what was he doing with that big brain of his? I did understand that this was an animal that possessed a huge brain and uh, very little was known about it. Uh, so I was uh, immediately interested in uh, finding out uh, something about this animal and what it used its brain for. The dolphin is in the water. So instead of just using what we call animal-assisted therapy, you are also using aquatic therapy. You have the chance then to bring the two therapies together at the same time. In the early years of, of human dolphin studies, 
it was often a tendency for us to try to teach the dolphins English. The twist that those studies have taken now are more to either develop a mutual language that's perhaps more of a challenge to, to both of us, to both species, or to look at their language or their communication system and determine is there something we can learn from the way they communicate with each other. I have a feeling that overtures are being made to us and we're just not responding. We just haven't, haven't got it yet. We do have a, a racial memory of being more aquatic than we are now. And I suspect this lies behind our fascination with aquatic creatures like dolphins. Let's look into dolphin physiology. The dolphin family is a, a family of m many dozens of species of animals, some of them uh, much smaller than others, and orca is the largest member of the family. Uh, dolphins inhabit every ocean of the world. Uh, they exist in some part in, in really huge numbers. Uh, dolphin families can have literally thousands, or these dolphin groups, communities, uh, not really sure of the correct social term, uh, can exist in, in many thousands of individual animals. Here you can find out about the different dolphins and their environments. Make your selection, then press any button.
Dolphins and whales are members of the same order of mammals, the cetaceans. Their bodies have evolved in various ways to help them live better underwater. For instance, their streamlined shape, which makes them better swimmers, or their nose, which evolved into the blowhole located on the top of the head. The bottlenose dolphin can swim at up to 25 miles per hour and dive down beyond 2,000 feet. Light doesn't travel well underwater, but sound can travel very far. So dolphins have much better hearing than vision. Touch is also important. When dolphins touch, they are communicating. And although they have a good sense of taste, they don't use their sense of smell very often. Make your selection, then press any button. Just how fast can dolphins swim? Most dolphins can swim up to 25 miles per hour, which is very fast. But the fastest of all is the orca, which can swim at an amazing 40 miles per hour. Dolphins have been seen to dive very deep in search of food. The bottlenose can dive to more than 1,600 feet and the long-finned pilot whale to more than 2,000 feet. Opinion varies, but Dr. Norris says that dolphins sleep in close groups with their echolocation inactive and one eye kept open, the one facing the other dolphins. There is always one dolphin on guard duty to watch out for predators. The one eye open lets them keep track of their relative positions in the group. With the outfacing eye closed, they sleep about four hours. Then they regroup, close the other eye, and sleep for another four hours. Dolphins kept in aquariums have been seen to float on the surface when sleeping. Um, well, dolphins have brains uh, anatomically um, as, as, as large as ours and as, as complex as ours. We think that our higher levels of, of mental processing of data and the intellectual processes associated with the appreciation of music, etc., are, are associated with the cerebral cortex, the upper layer of the brain. The bigger the surface area, the more cells you can get there. And that is one of the parameters that we associate with high intelligence and high intellect, and the dolphins are even more, their brains are more fissured than ours, and therefore able to accommodate more cells and therefore on that anatomical basis we would say that they have a capability for intelligence equivalent to that of human beings. Make your selection, then press any button. If we compare brain weights, whales have the heaviest brains, followed by elephants, dolphins, humans and chimpanzees. If we compare brain to body weight ratios, humans have the highest ratio, followed by dolphins, elephants, chimpanzees, and whales. So I think being in the water stimulated all those things, and probably developed um, brain complexity in cetaceans as it has in us. In the same way, it seems to me that the the brain, the big brains of dolphins came about entirely because of their retreat to the sea or their aquatic move. They left land as fairly simple, uh, brainy in the sense that a, a, a dog or a weasel is, but not bright in the way a dolphin is. 
So something must have pushed them into that, and I think it was being in the water that did it. Uh, it seems the evolutionary line runs from the land to a riverine situation and from there into the marine environment. Much has still to be discovered about the dolphin's evolution, but the ancestor of the modern dolphin is thought to date back about 20 million years. Let's find out what a dolphin's brain is really capable of. Dolphins have memories which uh, seem as good as ours. Um, we have to split uh, uh, phone numbers up into three digits at the first and four at the end because our memories begin to fail when we get seven uh, uh, unrelated things like numbers lined up. So we put a little dash in the middle and our phone number comes out 456-2307 uh, or whatever. The dolphin seems able to remember one more than we can. Dolphins are also great mimics. When they hear the cries of another animal, they will immediately try to copy the sound. Here dolphins are looking for food, so how do they catch food in the shadowy depth? We can't see it, but dolphins use sound waves to locate and identify underwater. They can see size, shape, weight, even internal organs with an accuracy far greater than our radar. This is called echolocation. The melembrane is unique to dolphins and is what makes echolocation possible. The melon is found in the dolphin's forehead and is separate from the brain. It is made of a special fatty tissue. The melon acts as a kind of radar dish, capturing and sending sound waves. Well, they use their sounds underwater to communicate. They also have sonar and can describe objects by means of sound, especially in the dark and the long distances, and in muddy water. They use frequencies, you know, very, very high, 30 kilohertz. Their sonar is about 150 kilohertz. Since that time, we found that dolphins do in fact put out a beam of sound, and they put it out of their forehead. It comes out just like the light on a railroad train's headlamp that goes back and forth. And uh, they in fact uh, hear sounds mostly through their jaws. Through the rear end of their jaws, they pick the sounds up. There's even some good evidence that if they open their mouths, they can actually hear them through the inside of their mouths, back in the corner of the jaw, and then this goes to either ear, depending on which side the sound hits. To produce sound, a valve below the blowhole is agitated by air expelled from the lungs. This dolphin seems to be searching for food. Let's watch for a while. Echolocation is not just used for finding food. By sending a powerful sound burst at its prey, the dolphin can disorient the prey and make an easy kill. Let's take a look at dolphin communication. One, two, three, four. Dolphins learning One, English? Two, three, four, five. 
John C. Lilly started the Janus Project in 1955. His aim was to learn the intelligence of dolphins and, if possible, teach them English or even learn the dolphins' language. Well, in the Virgin Islands, I had a dolphin pool and an isolation tank, and Margaret Howe uh, was teaching Peter Dolphin uh, English syllables, and he learned them pretty well. And then from that point, we went to uh, Coconut Grove, where we were teaching Elvar the same sort of things. And then we went from there to California and taught uh, Joe and Rosie by means of a computer. Now a computer can use the higher frequencies. Dolphins speak at 10 times our frequency and 10 times as fast. So that the program Janus was founded in order to take advantage of that. Research in aquarium tanks went on until 1964. From the 1970s, research shifted to the study of dolphins in the wild. One result of this was new information on the different ways dolphins communicate, information on the voice, on gesture, and on touch. The jump was found to be a way of communicating location, the crash of re-entry leaving bubbles for others to echolocate. Here are some young dolphins at play. Touch plays a very important part in communication among dolphins. Rubbing is an expression of intimacy. Head to head is used to show anger and aggression. As is open mouth confrontation or raking. Let's look more closely at vocal communications. When a dolphin sees someone it wants to talk to, it calls its name. The system is similar to telephone calling. Inside of a school, if one animal mimics the other, that phone line is open. Of course, everybody can listen in. It's a, it's a party line. But uh, that's the way much of the school is organized. Here are three forms of communication used by Atlantic spotted dolphins. Please select an example. Make your selection, then press any button. We also use uh, burst pulse sounds, which are another kind of social sound. And this is an example of a burst pulse sound. Um, this is, happens to be a synchronized squawk. This is a group of males that are chasing, male spotted that are chasing a bottlenose dolphin who happens to be an, an intruder in this case. And so they're coordinating their behavior, they're synchronizing their swimming, but they're also synchronizing their vocalizations and it's a very powerful sound. As you can see, it's very white and bright, so it's very intense. Dolphins communicate in a lot of different modalities. The one we've focused on over the years has been acoustic, so we've looked at their sounds. And what we've done over the years is to try to track individuals, uh, put their sounds on computer. Um, for example, here, there we'll see some uh, signature whistles of an individual we call White Patches. She's a young adult female that we've known. And they appear to use them both to express who they are. For example, a mother might make her signature whistle 
and then her offspring recognizes that whistle and will reunite with the mother. Or in some cases, it might be another dolphin using that mother's signature whistle to initiate contact with her. So in essence, it, it possibly functions as a name. Dolphins are also known to have things like distress whistles. Uh, they can also express excitement. Um, we have one vocalization we call an excitement vocalization that is actually like a signature whistle, but it's sort of out of control, and it, the dolphin often does it when it's excited about something or perhaps going into a distressed situation. And the function of that whistle is very clear. A mother or an older dolphin will come over and you know, tend that young animal and actually protect them or calm them down from the situation, so it does definitely express that kind of excitement to other dolphins in the group. Here are some recordings of orca voices. Please select an example. This is orca echolocation. Orca from the same pod communicating. <coughs> this is two adult orca calling each other. A mother and child calling each other. Let's take a look at the dolphin community. Most dolphins live in groups ranging in size from a few individuals to several thousand animals. Dolphins are perhaps the most social of all animals. The young, the old, male and female all cooperate together in a kind of mega family. The family protects itself, feeds together and in nurseries the older animals teach the young. Let me say that the magic of the school is quite real and it depends on a system within the school in which all the members are a part and in which they must suppress their individuality or it won't work. That means that in the split seconds during an attack, the animals become ciphers in a super organism, organismal school. They are parts of something larger than themselves that's the essence of cooperation. They've given themselves over into that cooperative system to a degree that very few other animals on Earth have, I think. Within each pod are groups organized according to age. Let's look at this with the Atlantic Spotted Dolphin. Please choose from these different groups.
Make your selection, then press any button. The male spotted are a bit different. They too grow up and change roles, but what happens to them is as they're growing up and getting mature and moving into sexual maturity, they actually form very tight coalitions with each other. This is where they learn how to court females, how to get into a lot of trouble as well. Um, and they form long-term bonds this way. Uh, these bonds may last a lifetime, but they use these bonds to forge together, uh, to move through different pods. We find the males um, range further and actually uh, move to other pods, perhaps to breed and to avoid inbreeding in their natal group. One of the first things that we noticed with the females was that they would reach a certain age, about nine or ten, and they would be moving into the age class and in the, in the degree of spotting that we would note as sexually mature. As they're getting to that age, they start taking on roles of babysitting younger dolphins in their group and taking those responsibilities, whereas a few years previous to that, they may have been babysat themselves. Shortly thereafter, in one or two years, they themselves are pregnant and having their own offspring. So in some ways, it's, it's a training for them to become more responsible for learning how to communicate urgency and things to younger members of their society. Um, the males and females grow up differently. Uh, they all stay with their mothers till about three when she has another offspring. And then they form uh, juvenile subgroups, often of the same gender. And this is where they learn to interact and, um, and behave like dolphins do as they get older. They may range anywhere from uh, 10 to 20 miles a day. The area we cover is about uh, 40 square miles. And these ranges can change with age. Sometimes we have dolphins that uh, immigrate to different pods in the area. There's two other uh, pods that we've been following that are sort of south and north of our main study area. Like other long-lived social mammals, they invest a lot in their offspring. They have one offspring at a time, at least for the majority of the time that we know. Um, they may spend three to five years uh, tending that offspring. Uh, the young nurse, for up to that period, up to three to five years, uh, they're certainly weaned and learn how to eat fish during that period of time. Females, when they get pregnant, which is at least at first around the age of 12 or 13, also they do change their association. For example, uh, three dolphins that we've known for years who grew up together, when one of them got pregnant, she immediately started associating with other older females that were pregnant, probably because they have to forage differently. They have to forage on different fish and perhaps more often uh, for their health. Um, and then once they all had babies, they got together and started associating again. So their reproductive status definitely affects their associations over the years. Make your selection, then press any button. For example, Dr. Norris told us that at one time, one of the two dolphins he was working with fell ill. The other dolphin helped the sick dolphin by pushing it up to the surface. And kept it there for a week without eating or sleeping the whole time. According to Dr. Norris, baby dolphins gather in a kind of playpen at the center of the pod. Mother and child swim together there, and the dolphins learn behaviors in this formation.
within the population, the, the communities are fairly highly structured. Uh, the northern resident community has 16 pods, and pods are uh, very closely related groups of families, uh, basically groups of, of sisters and their children or cousins and their children. And these are uh, groups which will relate to each other on a, on a fairly constant basis throughout life. But within those pods, there are nuclear family groups, and we call them matrilineal groups, uh, which consist of basically a mother and her children, and very possibly the mother's mother is also present. And these individuals in these nuclear families, these matrilineal groups, will stay together every day throughout their life. Let's take a rest. This is a dolphin photo book. The directional button turns the pages one at a time. A and B buttons make the pages turn automatically. And button C closes the book.
Let's look at human encounters with dolphins. Many people who meet dolphins now have an oral or written history which suggests that these were once terrestrial animals who shared our lives and spaces and only secondarily went back to the ocean. And I think that's a myth and I, I use the word myth gently because I don't mean something that is untrue. I think it's a, uh, a tribal memory is perhaps a better way of describing what this is. Uh, we share this awareness of dolphins because we follow the same pattern. I think it makes sense to us and we're receptive to it. Why is it that dolphins and humans have been linked for so long? Greek myths of the boy and the dolphin, the picture in the temple of Knossos, Sirius, and other legends. Did we once share the world in harmony with the dolphin? Even today, when we encounter dolphins, we make new legends for the generations to come. Make your selection, then press any button. And I was floating around in the tank one day and wondered what it would be like to float around 24 hours a day. And so I found the dolphins. They would act as if they were taking me into a dolphin group mind. And I'd say, oh no, no, I can only speak with one dolphin at a time. Jojo is an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin who has been living around the Turks and Caicos Islands in the West Indies since around 1980. Dolphins normally live in groups, but some, like Jojo, become separated from their groups and make friends with humans. Known as hermit dolphins, only 30 or 40 have been recorded around the world. Jojo is not a tame dolphin. He just likes to come and play with humans from time to time. Jojo's friend, Dean Barnall, works in marine wildlife preservation. Uh, we've got many, many data sheets, and all the information goes into a computer. And then one day we can ask the computer questions, and we can figure out how often Jojo was there, how long he was mating, which feeding grounds he utilizes the most, and which dolphins he's mating with. So we might even be able to come up with some sub substantial evidence to prove maybe if Jojo has a calf or not one day, um, if he sires a female dolphin by the name of Socrates or Jacqueline, and uh, perhaps we'll see a baby Jojo one day. And we'll also know where he goes when he grows up. Jojo has become an important symbol for marine wildlife preservation and for the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, I had an encounter off the Isle of Man with a friendly wild dolphin. Now these are dolphins that have separated themselves from their normal contact with the school of dolphins and are seeking human company and I had the magical experience of seeing this dolphin come up, up behind my son and then lift my son up in, on his head and then give him a ride around the harbour at Port St Mary. Um, and so here was me, a medical scientist in the 20th century, watching a story that could have unfolded 2,000 years ago, a boy riding on a dolphin. The Greeks made statues of it, they put it on their coins and so on. So when that happens, your destiny is changed. And really that was a changing point in my destiny. Let's look at the healing powers of dolphins. I was working with another friendly dolphin off the coast of Wales and I mentioned this. I was making a television film uh, called uh, Bewitched by a Dolphin and uh, I mentioned this 
in the hotel where we were all staying and a lady came up to me and said would I take her father out to see the dolphin she said he's a chronic depressive he hasn't worked for 12 years and so we took this man called Bill Bowell out to see the dolphin and he had that haunted look that clinical depressives have people who are in depression find that the world around them is so severe that they can't they can't take it so they bring an invisible barrier down and they appear to be normal there is nothing anatomically wrong with them which indicates that there's anything wrong but they just can't work on a mental level with other people and so we took this man out to see the dolphin and we put him in the water with the dolphin and I have never before seen such an instant bridge formed between a wild dolphin in the sea and a strange man and um, there was something happening we could see it there uh, and his wife who was in the boat saw it as well and when we pulled Bill out of the water eventually his wife started to cry and she said I've just seen the trace of the bill that I lost 12 years ago this incident led Dr. Dobbs to begin his research into the healing powers of the dolphin a project he named Operation Sunflower it was well known that the dolphin's echolocation allowed them to see not only the exterior of target animals, but also the internal organs and their condition. This led to the idea that perhaps dolphins could see psychological states too. When a dolphin comes towards you and when a dolphin sounds you you can feel it through your body some people feel it more than others and it's like getting a this blast through your whole system and it tingles and and people get a sense of well-being a whole feeling of well-being it's it's very similar to getting an ultrasound treatment in the doctor's office if you have sore muscles uh, sometimes doctors will give you ultrasound um, treatments for it. This is like your whole body getting an ultrasound treatment. And sometimes in the wild, if a pod, three or four dolphins can come at you at once and zzz, zap you all at the same time as they sound out your body. And you're, you just tingle and you come out of the water and it just feels great. You just had this, this uh, whole dolphin massage all through your system. I found that people were changed by encounters with dolphins. They were not necessarily cured by these people. In other words, if you, if you have a mental illness, I think what the do that you don't change um, a person who is an anorexic into a big, fat, cuddly, roly-poly person. But what you do is you enable them to come to terms with it. And I think that the way in which the dolphins are effecting this help and I won't call it a cure, but in the, in they, is, is that they actually trigger the, a, a mechanism that we have inside us which enables us to repair ourselves, to bring ourselves back into balance. There is still much research to do on the healing powers of animals, and already there are people who have made false or misleading claims. Um, one of the reasons is that the dolphin can then display all of his natural behaviors, which are curiosity, playfulness, interest in other beings, and all of these things then the dolphin brings to the therapy situation. And in the open sea, he can do this naturally, he can do this because of his choice. And this is very important uh, to me that we not exploit the dolphin, that we not misuse the dolphin, that we meet uh, the dolphin on his own terms, in his own place. Make your selection, then press any button. And that is many people, many therapists, many healers who know, really know nothing about the dolphin itself, only think about it in a, uh, a dream or a fantasy way, um, get involved in exploiting the dolphin by taking people uh, to aquariums, to places where dolphins are, are, are kept as, as, as prisoners for profit, and then they, in turn, uh, have begun to charge people 
for this activity and calling it healing when this is just not the case. This isn't what, what is going on. And so because um, they have misinformation about working with dolphins and doing therapy with dolphins, um, they can do a great deal of harm, not only to people but to the dolphin as well. There are many, many choices of animals, particularly horses. Riding therapy can be very, very effective. Many of the children that I've worked with with the dolphins also um, have gone and worked with horses when they have finished with the dolphins. Um, the, the water, the aquatic therapy is always available, whether you live by the sea or you have a pool. Just uh, having the handicapped person be able to be in the water, um, do different activities. There's very specific activities that the person can do um, to help them. So there's lots of different um, ways that people can find to use what is around them, to use the environment that they live in. I happen to live by the sea. But if you don't live by the sea, there are all kinds of alternatives that you can, can try that involve nature, that involve interaction with other species, that involve being involved with your environment. I think the way in which dolphins are affecting human beings is to actually use key energy, which is defined as the essential life force in traditional Chinese medicine. And I think that what the dolphins appear to be doing is channeling or directing key at the people who have encounters with them. I think that the end product is the, is the release of endomorphines, very much like the drugs I used to work on. In, in, the endomorphines are naturally generated morphine-like substances which, which make people feel happy, amongst other things. And I think that, although the, with the mechanism may not be clear, the end product is probably the release of endomorphines into the brain. And that, of course, gives us a feeling of happiness, of, of joy. And, and, and that's, what the dolph that's, that's how the dolphins are working. Let's look at our lives with dolphins. This is an edited version of a film about the release of a dolphin from an aquarium in Brazil. I used to train the television star Flipper, but for the last 23 years, I've been working to release captive dolphins back into the wild. This rescue would put all of my skills to the test. Ironically, the Brazilians also named their dolphin Flipper. He's a trained performer and had moments where he related well to me, but nearly 10 years in this tank have taken their toll. Flipper shows signs of serious depression. His snout was scarred from battering his head against the tank. His eyes were burning and shut from the chemically laced and filthy tank water. I wish you could smell it. It's absolutely cute. You can see it's black. Flipper was close to death. An angel appeared. A WISPA benefactor enabled us to rent a private helicopter and bypass military red tape. I stayed focused on our efforts, but couldn't help think about Flipper. It must have been confusing for him to be pulled from his tank. Dozens of hands, loud voices, pressing crowds, chaos. Flipper was taken to a carefully prepared ocean enclosure, close to a large wild dolphin community. For the first time in nearly ten years, Flipper would feel the rhythm of the tides where the healing process could begin. We had to move quickly. 
but I questioned. What did he have left? I took a deep breath and looked for a sign that he was ready for the weeks of hard work ahead. When a dolphin gives up, it doesn't eat. Would Flipper accept his first fish? But after a few weeks, he caught his first live fish in 10 years and turned up his snout at anything that didn't swim. His wild instincts were beginning to return. This is a behavior we never saw in captivity. Flipper's actually playing and having a good time. The fact that these wild dolphins come here every day is a big advantage because they do stop here and he goes up to the fence and something's happening. Then after only six weeks of rehabilitation, he was released back into the ocean. We found him more than 200 miles farther south. There are two other dolphins that he has been traveling with. They stay offshore. They're not really uh, fond of people or they're more careful of people, so they stay away. And somehow he connects up with them every day. He'll leave them and he will come here, hang out with the people or the surfers. You can see he hasn't lost any weight. He's perfectly uh, healthy. He looks great. <laughs> he looks a marvelous. But this had been a tough rescue. One that shows that rehabilitation and release can work. Of the nearly 1,000 dolphins in captivity worldwide, many can be set free. I know not everyone agrees with me. So there are battles ahead of us. But for the moment, seeing Flipper as he should be, visiting us on his own terms, healthy and in his natural surroundings, gives me hope for the others. Rick Cobarry and his friends continue their work worldwide. Dolphins and humans' most intense relationship involves fish. Because of man's dependence on fishing, Dolphins are increasingly seen as rivals for rapidly depleting fish stocks. Many fishermen see dolphins as nothing but pests. Even whale and dolphin watching can harm dolphins, since their hearing is extremely sensitive to the sounds of boats and people. Is it really possible for us to live in harmony with other animals? We must face this question not just for the sake of the dolphins, but for ours too. You don't have to have all the gadgets of high technology to enjoy yourself. You don't have to have a huge sports car. You don't have to have lots and lots of mechanical things because we're being driven by market forces. Market forces keep telling us that we must, even jogging, which you would think would be a very, they now sell jogging gear. You can spend a lot of money buying special shoes and all of those. All you need to do is to actually get out there and run. You know, on in your bare feet with no clothes on and actually enjoy yourself jogging. Um, but I think, so what they're saying to us is, look, you can have fun without having lots of complex things around you. And of course, once you've learned to do that, you can then start to relate to a tree. In human relationships, uh, even in love relationships, we always have certain expectations and certain needs that we want met. When the person and the dolphin meet in the sea, the dolphin wants nothing from us. He has no uh, other needs to be met other than just to play and care for us and give us his unconditional love. The love he gives us comes without any strings, without any conditions attached. <laughs> and whales may be agents of echo the way we are coming slowly but you have to believe all this <laughs> the problem with the mind are other limits but watch out for the limits of the body